Hello and welcome everybody from uh, Emmaus Cornwall. Um, my name's Jo Riley. I'm one of the trustees at Emmaus Cornwall. And while the last few people are uh, sneaking into the back of our virtual village hall and settling down in their seats, I'll tell you a little bit more about Emmaus Cornwall and what we are trying to do um, and why you're all here this evening. And I would like to say an enormous thank you um, on behalf of us uh, to all of you for buying a ticket for this event and for the many donations that you made in addition to the ticket price. Um, Emmaus is a homeless charity with a difference. Um, they create uh, communities for people who have experienced homelessness and social exclusion. And those communities provide uh, not just a bed for the night, but a home for as long as the residents um, called companions uh, might need a home, as well as meaningful work opportunities to help them get back on their feet. Um, we are fundraising uh, to create the first Emmaus community in Cornwall. Um, and all uh, of your support is enormously helpful and makes a huge difference to our fundraising efforts. Um, I'm so pleased to see so many people uh, at this event, friends old and new and near and far, thanks to the magic of Zoom. Um, this is only our second online event, so if there are any technical hitches, please do bear with us. The weather is a little fresh in Cornwall. I don't know if that makes any difference, but just in case, we will try and get things back online if anything does go wrong um, as soon as we possibly can. So this evening's event is hosted once again by um, author Kathy Renson-Brink, and I am really delighted to tell you that Kathy has kindly agreed to become our ambassador for Emmaus Cornwall. She's our first ambassador and we couldn't be more pleased to have her. Um, and tonight, Kathy is going to be talking to a man who really needs no introduction, Terry Waite. Um, and, uh, Everybody knows quite a lot about Terry's life, but perhaps what they don't know is that he is the president of Emmaus UK. And uh, he will be talking about um, his long connection with the charity and uh, the difference that he has seen uh, uh, in terms of what an Emmaus community uh, can do and the, and the positive impact that it has on uh, companions, uh, as well as many other facets of his extraordinary life so far. Um, if you'd like to ask any questions, please put those in the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Um, and without further ado, I would like to hand over now to Cathy and Terry for what is bound to be a fascinating conversation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joe, and welcome everyone. It's a pleasure to see you again. I know I'll be seeing a lot of people who are here who were here when we were with Raina Wynn before. So I'm thrilled to be back here for another um, inspiring and insightful evening. I uh, can't tell you how excited and honoured I feel to be in the chair to interview Terry Waite. So welcome, Terry, welcome to this evening. Thank you for being here with us. Thank you. It's very nice to be here tonight. It looks as though <clears throat> you and I are both in a library. I mean, you're <laughs> I've, got, I've got books behind me. It's a literary evening almost. <laughs> it is, isn't it? It's lovely. I think, I mean, they do really, they cheer me, my books. I like to have them. It feels, uh, I always feel sort of safe when I'm surrounded by them, I think. Well, someone once said to me, even if you don't read them, they provide good insulation. <laughs> I'm sure that's true. Um, thank you so much for joining us this evening. I've been uh, thinking about you and reading about you a lot the last couple of days and talking about you to my son who's 11 and experienced that interesting thing you get with children sometimes where they ask you questions and you come up short against your own lack of knowledge and so I thought maybe we could start with I was telling him about you being held hostage and he asked why he said why did they want to put him in a room on his own 
Is it okay if I start with that question to you? By all means, by all means, yes. Well, my own experience of working for the release of hostages goes back a long way. Um, back to the days when I'm with my wife and then three small daughters, our son was born later, we went to Uganda. And in Uganda, uh, it's a beautiful country, and we were warmly received and made many good friends there. But during the time we were there, the Amin coup took place. And it was a revelation to me. It was the first time in my life that I'd seen people murdered before my eyes, beaten to death. Um, I learned a great deal from that. Uh, many of my colleagues and friends were taken and thrown into prison. And I had the job in, of, which I voluntarily sought, to try and obtain their release. And I was successful in a couple of cases, but uh, many not successful and many of my friends were murdered. And I had direct dealings with General Amin, who was a very unusual man, as you might expect. That gave me the first experience of negotiating at that level and of some of the political complexities of negotiating at that level. Um, and uh, I suppose one of the principal lessons I learned from it was that when law and order breaks down in a country, all hell breaks loose. It doesn't matter whether it's Africa, whether it's the United States of America, as we've seen recently in the um, in Washington. It doesn't matter whether it's black, white, yellow, whatever race people are. When law and order goes, um, people behave in, or are capable of behaving and sometimes do behave in most appalling ways. Well, I went on from that experience to work in virtually every troubled part of the world. And then I was recruited by the Archbishop of Canterbury, principally to be his advisor on international relations he wanted someone on his staff who had experience of uh, international affairs, who knew the world, and I'd traveled, lived in many countries and traveled the world very widely. And so I was responsible for his ecclesiastical and diplomatic exchanges, meeting with heads of state, meeting with heads of churches, meeting with the Pope, all that sort of business. But during that time, um, it was um, a time when there was increased hostage taking. And you probably remember going back to the time the Shah um, was deposed, British hostages were taken. The American hostages got prominence, but there were British hostages there too. Um, and some of the British hostages were the members of the Anglican communion, of which there was a small church there. The bishop's son was murdered, the bishop was forced into exile, and a whole group of, uh, of workers, um, John and Audrey Coleman, who were, um, John was a doctor working out there, and many, many disappeared. And of course, the problem came to my desk in Lambeth Palace. And the Archbishop said, what, what should we do? I said, the only way to deal with this is for me to get out there and try and see what can be done. Well, to cut a long story short, I'm not going to go into all the complexities of that, but it was possible to get out there, to meet with revolutionary guards, and to uh, obtain the release of a number of people. I got into the Avian prison. Very interesting little story about that. Jim Waddell was the bishop's secretary, and uh, she was living alone, she was a single lady, living alone in a flat in Tehran. One evening she opened the door and was shot. And had not her neighbor been a medical practitioner, she'd have died. And when she recovered, she was thrown into the Avene prison, the very same place that Nazarene Radcliffe has been and many others have been. And uh, well, uh, I got to see her in the prison. I actually got into the prison through my contact with Revolutionary Guards, which was a good relationship. And she said to me, she said, uh, how are my family? I said, they're fine. 
and she repeatedly asked me the question. I said, they're fine, I repeated it. When she eventually came out, I said, Jane, why did you ask me so often about your family? Was something particularly worrying you? And she'd been told, falsely, that her family had come out to see her, had been put in the cell next door, and were being tortured. And that was in order to get Jean to give information which she didn't have. Of course, she was accused, along with the others, the famous, the old, old accusation of engaging in espionage, which, of course, you're definitely innocent. But, to their credit, I say this, I was able to convince Revolutionary Guard that the charges they brought against the whole group were false, and they honoured their promise. So, and they, they released them. But uh, it just showed me that there is a way of resolving problems by talking with people, by the diplomatic means, rather than going to war. And rather than being aggressive and going in and saying, you terrible people, get to the root of the issue, find out what it is, why people are behaving as they're behaving. From that, I went on to speak, uh, to deal with um, hostages who were in uh, Libya with Gaddafi, met with Gaddafi face to face. Beirut. Now, Beirut was a situation where there were many, many hostages. Um, British, John McCarthy, Brian Keenan, Terry Anderson, the uh, American, and so on. And uh, all their families came to Lambeth because they knew of my reputation there. And they said, can you help us? And I said, no. I, I just cannot take on another case. And after many requests, I agreed. And I, I always have this in mind, really, that if you take up a case on behalf of a family or friends who are really desperate and you agree to do something, you should stay with it until your involvement becomes actually dangerous for the hostages themselves you know very well you're going to face danger yourself. You know that if you're, you'd be a fool not to recognise that. You know very well that you stand a chance of being captured. You know very well you stand a chance of being killed. You measure that risk and you take it. And if it goes wrong, you don't blame other people. You say, that was my responsibility. I made that decision. I went out there. I was able to at least have a part in obtaining the release of a couple of people I was able to meet with face to face, the only person so to do with the kidnappers. They did see me, they would see me. And then because of, um, I was offered, I never got to see the hostages. I was given proof of life, photographs, but I was never, never got to see them. And then uh, I got a, a message when I was back there that one of the hostages was ill and about to die. And they said, this time we'll allow you to see them. And I said, I come with you, you'll keep me. They said, no. And they said, I said, give me 24 hours to think about it. And they said, yes, okay. So I went away, took advice. You could imagine the three sets of advice. Don't touch it. You'll probably be. You will be, you know, those three sets of advice. My feeling is now, I would not wish anybody listening to what I'm saying now to run away with the idea that I am full of altruism. I'm not. I believe that when I do something or most people do something for others, there are a few exceptions to this, they're unconsciously or consciously doing something for themselves. And my feelings went as follows. If that man if they're telling me the truth, if that man dies and I haven't got the courage of my conviction to go and see him, then I'm going to have to live with my conscience for the rest of my life. That's how my feeling went. You can argue that was a foolish thing to say. That's how I felt. I went back and was captured. Now, why? Uh, to come back more directly after a long, long route, route to come, Marty. They wrongly believed that I was an agent of government, that I was a foreign agent, that I was either an agent of America. They knew I had contacts with America. They knew I had uh, visited uh, the White House. I had meetings with the president about hostages. They knew all that. 
because they gave me messages that I had to take to the White House. But when an event called Iran-Contra broke, which is a complicated issue, and if anybody asks a question later, I'm perfectly prepared to explain it. When that broke and I was associated with America, they said, huh, he will know more about that than we know. Let's take him and question him. Why they kept me in solitary confinement for almost five years is frankly, I'm not sure. And nobody's ever given me any reasonable explanation for that. I just don't know. The brothers who kept together, as you know, John and Brown, McCarthy and Brown Keenan kept together, Terry Anderson and others. I was kept totally alone, for, excepting for the past few, um, few weeks. And so that was it. I was there, I was in a cell, I was chained to the wall, and um, it was quite an extreme form of lockdown. <laughs> <laughs> Can you, um, it happened quite a long time ago, you've written about it, you've talked about it. When I ask you about it now, I'm really interested to know, do you still feel it in your body? Can you still, does it, st how do you, experience it now is it a story that you tell or could or do you still feel them could you still feel that early realization emotionally about what has happened well can i can i i'll, I'll answer that but can i just it so happens that i i wrote a series of poems and i'll tell you why afterwards i wrote them mm. and there's one here which i think explains that the pain sears my soul, penetrates to the very depth of my being. At night, alone, I weep the tears of anguish, of loss, of despair. Take heart. Through pain you have entered a new realm. You have joined the community of compassion. Your sorrow will be turned to joy. Your tears will become laughter. Your wound will remain, but through suffering, you have a new depth of soul. So I say that, yes, the wound still remains in part, um, but I firmly believe that it's possible to turn negative experiences around. And as that little poem says, your sorrow will be turned to joy. You can, because within every situation of difficulty and despair, I believe that there are the seeds of creativity, the seeds of new hope. And I think that's important to say that at this particular time, because I'm acutely conscious of the fact that there are many people who are facing a very uncertain future as far as employment goes, as far as their, their own health goes, and certainly with the mayors. I mean, one's been dealing with that for years. Men, men and women who've been facing an extremely uncertain future. But I'm convinced that in the majority of cases, it can be turned. And so that has been my experience. I've tried to take it. For instance, when I came out of captivity, my job had been held open for me. And uh, I said, I'm, I'm not going to take it up. I'm going to um, earn my own living by writing and lecturing. And I'm going to give my time away to things like Amers, which I helped found, um, Hostage UK, which I founded, international work with young people. I'm not going to take money from any of them. Now, before the experience of captivity, I would have never had the courage to give up a salary because I've been used all my life to having a salary um, and there would be some people again watching who are probably facing that situation you know of not having a salary in the future or they may doubtful whether they will have well, all I can say is don't despair no there is a possibility there are possibilities if you look for them and find them not for everybody I admit but for many and would you say that both back then and now, 
is the ability to think the way you do, which I admire and think that that's wonderful and would serve us all. I'm wondering to what extent that is linked to a faith or a belief. And I know that um, you're not, people often think you are a clergyman, which you're not, um, but perhaps you just talk to us a bit about how that, how that relates or, or indeed not um, to, to, the, to that sort of philosophy. Well, I hope I won't offend anybody, but I would like to say that for much of my life, I was pressured to become a clergyman and I always said no. And, and am I thankful that I said no? <laughs> it would be entirely wrong for me. I'm not, I couldn't be confined in that way. I'm much more of a free spirit, too, too independently minded. I'm not a maintainer. I'm more of a, an explorer, if you like, mm -hmm. didn't like that. But having, um, having said that, coming back to the question of faith, um, I suppose my views really, to be honest, would be considered to be unorthodox or even heretical. Um, I don't believe, for example, that if you have faith, then you are going to be protected from the normal ups and downs of life. Mm -hmm. I think you, we take our chance as human beings with each other and we face what comes. And faith does not necessarily say, ah, oh, Terry Waits, a man of faith, he'll be protected. I don't, I don't think that's, that's sensible. I think the whole religious understanding is a mystery, to be honest. Um, we are a mystery. The, the reason we're here on earth is a mystery. The re, the, what lies beyond is a mystery. And that the, um, the churches and the great faiths actually give a framework within which we can proceed to explore and develop that mystery within ourselves and that mystery which lies beyond ourselves. Mm -hmm. And the frameworks are different. I happen to be born in a Christian framework. Somebody else happens to be born in an Islamic framework and so on and so forth. But if you examine the vast majority of the great faiths are pointing towards that great mystery which we call God. And we move towards it in our different traditions in different ways. And I think that is the way in which I, I, I look at it. And in captivity, I never felt the close presence of God. I felt alone, I felt isolated, but I said to myself in the face of my captors, I said this, um, you have the power to break my body, and you've tried because I was tortured and I did face a mock execution. You have the power to bend my mind and you've tried because I was interrogated, but my soul is not yours to possess. Now you asked me for a definition of soul, I'd be very hard put. All I could say was, I think soul for me means the total person that I am, the complete person, as, as, as I can understand it. And that does not lie in the hands of man to take, or woman for that matter. Mm -hmm. And so that was the attitude that, that, I, that I take, an attitude I take towards faith. I don't despise the framework. If I look at the framework, I regard it like this rather like the handrails, the banisters that you hold on to and that lead you on. And where we make our big mistake in the churches in argument between the churches and arguments between the great faiths is we're arguing about the banisters. We're not arguing about the essence and the essence is so much greater and so much more wonderful than the banisters. If the banisters help you, Fine, hold on to them, but they're not the essence, and that is that would be my approach. That's very interesting. Thank you. I wonder, would you tell us a bit more about that? You were often in the dark. You didn't have books. You said you felt alone. Did you? How did you? I mean, what what happened in your yeah. mind? Well, I was moved from place to place. First of all, I was in an underground um, prison. And I, first reaction really was one of anger. I was very angry. 
I was angry with myself for taking such a risk. And I was angry with my captors for breaking their promise because they promised not to keep me. And if you're angry, you have to do something about it. Um, and I didn't eat for a week. And at the end of the week, I was able to really come to terms with it and somehow come to terms with anger within myself. I think, you know, if you allow anger to, again, I know it's another poem about anger, which is, I can, one of the very few I can remember. Anger is like a consuming fire, seeking all whom it may devour. Do not extinguish the flames totally, but calm yourself by the gentle glow of the embers. In other words, saying, we've all got to get angry. We all have anger within us. It can be a destructive or creative force. Try and use it creatively. And it takes, it takes, it takes, it takes a while for me, it took me a while to get to on that understanding that it could be, it was going to destroy me if I was just continuing to be angry. Mm. But then I was moved um, into, sometimes into a, a room, an upper room in a bombed out building. Metal shutters were put in front of the window so there was no natural light. I was chained by the hands and feet for 23 hours and 50 minutes a day. Um, I was on the floor, slept on the floor, on a um, mattress on the floor. Um, there were no books and papers for almost well, over three years, almost four years. Um, no companionship, no radio, no communication with anyone. And when anyone came in the room, I was blindfolded. So um, it was a, it was a good a good lockdown if you like put it like mm. that. Really truly isolated and put it away. And I realized in that situation that there was very little I could do to keep myself physically well. I could do very limited physical exercise, which um, I've never been keen on physical exercise anyway, so I didn't really miss it terribly. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I read, at the same time, I said that the secret to getting through this is to keep yourself mentally alive. Keep your brain going. Whatever, whatever happens, keep that moving. So I began to write in my head. I mean, I wrote my first book in my head. I had no pencil and paper. And then I wrote stories in my head. And I composed poetry. And I remembered also music, that I've always been a lover of music. There was no music, but I, you know, I wasn't allowed to sing. I had to keep, I hadn't allowed to do, make any noise whatsoever. And it was by keeping my mind alive all the time that I, I was able to, to move forward. I remember once saying, um, music, like good language, has the capacity to breathe harmony into the soul. And I wondered, looking back on it, I wondered why I was suddenly driven into writing poetry, if you like. And I think what it was, was a way of trying to, for me, find inner harmony. Um, Recognising that that's what I needed to have. I needed to have this inner completeness, this inner harmony, rather than allowing myself to be fragmented by the experience and good language and the music I remembered was an aid to enabling me to have that degree of inner harmony. Mm. Um, I also remember, I, the two interesting stories about it, which I share with you. I did have a chance to escape. Um, I was given one visit to the bathroom a day when my chains were unlocked and I was told to go in quickly and to wash my clothes and shower and very primitive, very primitive setup. And in that bathroom, high up on the wall, there was a window, it was on the third floor, and there was a window. And it was normally padlocked with a wooden shutter. And one day I went in, the padlock had been loosed. Now it's impossible to escape because it was three stories up. No, no chance of that. But I remember clambering up there and looking down on the street below and there was a lady walking along and she had a huge bunch of flowers and I thought how wonderful because it was the first time I'd seen colour in years mm -hmm. and 
you know, that rather trite saying came to mind, which I realise isn't a trite after all. The best things in life are free. They're all around you. It gave me a deeper appreciation for the natural world, for the beauty that's around us. And, you know, I can say today it almost pains me, physically pains me, when I see how we destroy that and how we rape the earth and, and destroy the natural environment. It does hurt. The other time I went into the bathroom and lo and behold, the door was pulled to. It wasn't locked, it was just pulled to. And there on the system was a, a revolver, a weapon. And I looked at it and I thought, well, I had military training. I was one of the last of national service years. I thought, well, here's a chance to escape. And then quick as a flash, I said, what have you been saying to people you've been negotiating with? You've always said, when you're in a situation of extremity, don't use violence, mm. use your brain. <laughs> you know, we say things and they have a habit of coming back to us. Here were my own words coming back to me now. Was I going to fall? And I, I called him back and said, look, take it. And he snatched it quickly. Subsequently, I, you know, I wondered, was that a, a trick? Was it a, were they testing me or was it? I think it wasn't a trick. I think it was for real. But again, don't think I'm just being a goody goody there. When I, when I felt this though, I felt this. There comes a time in many people's lives and certainly in mine, when you really have to stand on what you believe. You can make many compromises. I've made many compromises. I've made many mistakes in life, so many. I, I, don't, I hate to think of them. But, you know, there comes a time when you've got to say, I'm being tested here and I must stand by what I believe. Because if I'd have taken that gun and shot my way out, if it had been, you know, if that would have been possible, I'd have lost any integrity that I had left. And what counted for me in that situation was to try and retain at least some integrity as a person and some integrity of belief. And um, so I don't, I don't regret taking that decision, although <laughs> I was there for another three years after that. Mm. But there we are. You said about, I'm very interested in this as a writer, you said about writing your first book in your head. Um, <laughs> When you were released and had actual paper and pens, could you then could you then remember everything that had been happening in your mind? Well, yes. It's, you know, a lot of people think, well, was that just you know writing word for word, paragraph for paragraph? It wasn't. It was more of conjuring up the images, the pictures, mm. maintaining the inner dialogue. You know, we all have that dialogue with ourselves, and it's important to maintain it, to keep it going, and to keep. And also to keep it within boundaries. That's it's very interesting um, for me because um, if you're going to write and if you're going to express yourself in this way, you need imagination. And imagination has to be controlled. It has to be given certain boundaries. And I, well, by that, uh, I use an example. I was uh, concerned very concerned about my family, my wife, my children. I thought, for example, would my taking this risk that I'd taken, would this really detrimentally affect my children, their education? Would they have dropped out of university? Well, I, or, or when some were going, two were going to university and the other two were in high school. Um, I underestimated the resilience of children, I have to say that. They all, all four of them went on and got their degrees at the next stage, but that's another thing. But what I had to do, I had to do what many long-term prisoners do, and that is almost put the family out of my mind, put them to the back of my mind, not dwell on that. Mm -hmm. And that requires a discipline, a discipline of imagination. And somehow you can't, you can't just allow your imagination to run away with you. You have to control it. And by writing was a way of controlling it. 
uh, structuring it in certain directions. I've known people, I mentioned that this question of inner dialogue and inner talk, inner voice with yourself, talking with yourself. I've known of people and actually come across somebody who cut off that inner dialogue, cut off all communication with anybody um, when it was possible to have communication, cut off that dialogue with himself, fell into a deeply depressed state and fell into deep mental illness. Mm -hmm. So it is important actually to keep imagination going, keep the dialogue going, keep it moving. And in the same, same way, keep yourself within the discipline framework. Mm -hmm. um, I wonder, would you, I'm very interested in how hindsight works for you. You know, what you knew then, what you knew now, how it felt like to be released then, what you may think about it now. Does the, does the experience change and mutate for you over the years or has it, has it remained the, the same? Is it some, and do, do you perhaps still gain new insights in it or do you think of it something that happened and that you now understand fully? Well, it's, it's been, I've tried to make the experience a blessing, uh, not just for me, but for other people which is one of the reasons why um, I uh, joined uh, in getting Emmaus off the ground mm. all those years ago in Cambridge when Selwyn Image and the Archbishop of Canterbury, who was the first president, I'm the second, he said to me, he said, I would like you to take an interest in Emmaus. He said, I think it's something you'll understand. And so I, I, I did, I, I became involved in that and helped get the first community moving in, in Cambridge. Took a lot of hard work, but we got it going. One of the most flourishing communities in the country now. But um, again, was, it gave me, I suppose the experience gave me a much deeper understanding of the pain of other people. You know, it's one thing to be sympathetic and to say, oh yes, I have sympathy for the homeless. I have sympathy for the downcast. I have sympathy for people who suffer. It's another thing to have empathy. Mm -hmm. Say, I know what it's like. I know what it's like to lie on the floor and be cold and have nothing. I know what it's like to be beaten and kicked around. I know what it's like to look death in the face. Now, all those experiences are experiences that the homeless people have, and prisoners as well. Um, they're an experience, and, and ordinary people, people who are not, not homeless or not in prison, we all have similar experience. I know what it's like. And I also know that it's given me that insight, and it's given me a, a compulsion to say, whilst I'm on this earth, whilst I've got life, I really must at least try and do something to alleviate the suffering that's mm. in the world. To try and work on that front. And it's, it's difficult, it's frustrating, it's hard work, but I, I, I can look back and say, yes, I'm glad I had that experience. That may sound very strange. Now, if you say, would you like to do it again? I say, oh, well, no. Yeah. I think once is enough, you know, really, I don't particularly, I'm not looking for trouble, but when you have trouble, I want to say, let's try and take it and use it, rather than mm. cursing it, mm. so I don't look back and curse the day, I look back and say, okay, it taught me a great deal, it taught me a lot. Mm -hmm. I noticed right at the beginning when you were talking about Idi Amin, you said, <laughs> and you said, you said, I learned a great deal from that. Um, and I've been one of my own lockdown things is I worked out that doesn't matter what else happens when I go to bed I can say to myself I learned a lot about being a human being today and it just it just gives me the it just gives me a, a little energy burst a little a, you know it transforms from you know woe is me that's awful what did I do to deserve this why did I have to witness this awful thing today I just say I learned a lot about being a human being today and it 
there's a chink of light there's a this is what i'm here for this is what experience is um can i tell you can i tell you i mean it's been very serious i mean i've been talking as though i'm you know very pious guru can i give you two two, which i'm not can i give you two two little amusing stories Mm. well when after about oh almost five years I became very ill with a, a bronchial infection and they decided to move me and the way of moving people well, hostages in those days was to bind you from head to toe in masking tape uh, and um, then you know so you couldn't move and then they'd pick you up and throw you into the boot of a car and uh, I'm uh, six foot six or I was six foot seven I think but I've, I've shrunk a bit Anyway, a reasonably large person to throw into the boot of a car. So they came to move me. They wrapped me in this tape and uh, took me out and threw me into the boot of a car. And I landed in there. I realized there was another body in there. And I managed to get the tape off my mouth. And I said, huh, not much room in here. And the voice came back and said, until you came in, there was plenty of blooming room. <laughs> And that was that was John McCarthy. That was my first meeting with John in the back of a car. And thereafter, we spent um, the last uh, last weeks or months together with John and Terry. Another thing I am about that experience, if I can tell you, if I'm not boring you too much, was I was I was, I was so badly ill. I got this bronchial infection, which cured, was cured with antibiotics when I came out. But I, I had to sit with my back against the wall day and night. I just couldn't breathe. And at night time was particularly bad. And I always remember Terry Anderson leaning across and putting his hand on mine. He didn't say anything. And I realized at times, you know, I realized that often when I've been visiting somebody who's been critically ill, I've said to myself, what do I say? And I realise it's not important. What is important is another human being who's there and who will be with you and who will put their hand on yours if you like and just say I'm with you. That really meant a, a tremendous, a tremendous amount to me and uh, something I, 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 I don't forget. And that was in those, those years of, of captivity. We have some wonderful questions coming in from our audience. So I think I might go to there. Um, jo Dent is asking, she says, do you think you have to have experienced... This, this is a lady called Jo Dent in the audience, yeah. is, right. is asking, do you think you have to have experienced something to feel empathy? Um, I don't know whether you have to, Jo, but um, I think it certainly helps. But there are many people who've experienced rather difficult things and have not, uh, it's not led them to have empathy, it's led them to bitterness. It's led them to say, oh, crikey, you know, I'm going to show them and fight back. Well, you, you know, you, it's up to you. you, it's the approach you take, the way you go. So I don't think it's necessarily the case that if you, it will lead to to empathy. It can, but it's very much in your court, I think, whether it will or not. That would be my answer. That's a wonderful answer. Thank you. And Tessa Robertson is asking, do you forgive your captors? Well, that's a that's a very good question, Tessa. Thank you for asking that. Um, I believe that what they did was illegal. It was against the law and it was against all that's decent. And I think that if you do that, if you break the law in that way, you should face the just, face justice. That, that is only fair. Having said that, I think I can have understanding and sympathy for them in, 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 insofar as the young lads who were looking after us and who were a member of this terrorist gang were youngsters who'd been brought up always the bottom of the pile. 
economically, religiously, socially, politically. They were always in that position. Along comes a charismatic leader and says to them, well, join this group and you'll be able to fight for your rights. You will get what you deserve if you fight for your rights. Come and join us. They join and when they're in, there's no escape for them. I'll give you an example. When I was in the early years of captivity, when, uh, when John and Brian were in the early years of captivity, they were together. The food they were given became very bad and they complained a lot and nothing happened. And then one day the head man came to see them and he said, well, what are you getting? They told him. He said, that's wrong. Um, and so he looked into it and he discovered that the guard on duty, the young lad on duty, had been given money to buy food. He pocketed half and kept the other half. So they took that lad out and they shot him because they said, give the game away uh, over a small matter. Someone comes with a big bribe, you give the whole organization away. Illustrating the point that, well, once you're in, you're in. Mm -hmm. And it's the very same dynamic, you know, that exists in gangs in, in, in the UK today. The very same dynamic is operative there. Different aims and purposes, of course, but the same dynamic. The other thing I would uh, want to say about it has gone completely from my head, so I won't say it. I was going to say it. <laughs> <laughs> well, Sorry. we've got lots of wonderful questions, so I'll move on to another one. So Claire Herbert is asking, have you had contact with your um, with the people who captured you since your release? Oh, well, I, actually, Claire, you must be psychic because that was the <laughs> other point I was going to make. Really, seriously. Um, Yes, um, I, going back many, many years, as I've told you, I went to see them at night and was given a promise and that promise was broken. Now, years later, after my release, I felt I've got to go back. And I've got to try and take something creative from this experience. And so I went back to Beirut and I went at night to their headquarters and sat opposite one of the leaders of the group. He was somewhat surprised to see me and surprised, but he did see me. And I said to him, I said, look, I said, we've had our difficulties in the past. You have changed, you've moved on. I have changed. Can we take anything creative from this experience? He said, well, what can we do? I said, I've just come back from the Syrian border and I've seen people who are hungry, who are tired, who are dispossessed. I said, at least can you let me have eating oil for them? He said, yes, we'll do it. A very, very small gesture. But building on that, on my, uh, my birthday, uh, one year, the Lebanese ambassador in London uh, gave a reception for me. And from that, we were planning this year to go back and begin a series of peace building projects across Lebanon. That was knocked on the head for two reasons. One, because of the intense, desperate political situation in Lebanon. And two, of course, primarily because of COVID. Mm -hmm. So, yes, I have had contact. And as soon as uh, it's possible before I die. I'm 82 now, but I'm hoping to have a few more years, <laughs> active years, before I finally depart. I really do want to go back and I do want to get some of those projects moving. Mm -hmm. Charlotte Caldwell says, do you think your great humour was pivotal in helping you cope? <laughs> Which is a nice compliment and a question in one, isn't it? And very true. Yeah. Well, I know Charlotte Caldwell, and she has a great humour also. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hello, Charlotte. Nice to nice to <laughs> hear you, or, or hear of you. Put it that way. Uh, yes, I think a sense of humour. I'll give you. I'll give you one funny thing that happened. Um, 
and this is absolutely true. It sounds incredible, but it's perfectly true. Um, in the early stages, um, they tried one form of interrogation by blindfold. I was blindfolded, obviously, taken into a room, sat in a chair. Uh, someone sat behind me, and then they took the blindfold off, and in front of me was a camera, and behind the camera was someone wearing a balaclava, a very sinister looking, you know. And the person behind me said, um, now speak to the camera and tell us the story of your life. So I was feeling very bullshy. And I thought, right, you've asked for the story of my life, you will get it. After about half an hour, I got to the age of about four or five. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, behind me, I heard this peculiar noise. And I thought, what on earth is that noise? And it was, a, it went on and on. Then I realized what it was. The person behind me had fallen fast asleep. <laughs> <laughs> I wish all my interrogations were that amusing. They went yeah. to be a bit more serious after that. <laughs> but that, so, yeah. There were one or two times when you could laugh. Mm -hmm. And um, I also, I'll tell you another thing, actually, interestingly enough. Um, my dreams. My, I often woke up uh, and I would woke up laughing. Um, I had such funny dreams. And I, I don't know what, what it was, but I, I interpreted it at the time as um, almost a compensatory mechanism. You know, the, the bleakness and misery of the day was being compensated for in dream life and sort of the, the misery of the day was being con uh, compensated for by humor at night mm -hmm. when I was unconscious and could dream. And uh, so quite good dreams, really. <laughs> That's wonderful. Got a lovely practical question here from Sue Ferguson, who asks, what was your first meal when you got home? Uh, do you know, I do not recollect what it was um, and to be perfectly honest I had not I, I didn't miss food all that much I mean I got very meager food and over five years I got accustomed to eating very sparsely and so when I came out I just ate very sparsely what was important when I came out was to it did take a time it did take time I was very fortunate, along with the family, we were able to go to a secluded place to be able to tell our stories, different stories, because the family have equally a difficult time as, as, as us, if not greater in some respects. Um, and for the first week, I couldn't sit down and have a meal with the family. Because I found the emotional strain of that too great. And I used to get up in the night and eat in the night. And then gradually, someone said to me, when you come out of an experience of, of trauma, whatever it may be, take it as though you're coming up from the seabed. If you come up too quickly, you get the bends. If you come up gently, you'll be fine. And I was lucky because I was elected to a fellowship in Trinity Hall, Cambridge. And I lived in college for the middle part of the week and went home at weekends and gradually came back into life. And, um, but as for the first meal, I, I soon got into the habit of good meals because meals in a Cambridge college were not too bad. <laughs> <laughs> so I soon developed bad habits. And did you have that good advice then? Because I remember, I remember years ago seeing a newspaper, a front page, and it was people who'd been let out of prison after a miscarriage of justice. And they were sort of champagne court popping in this picture. And I remember, and I was, it was a lot, I was a lot younger then, but I remember feeling this utter sense of dread and just hoping someone was looking after them, just feeling what a disaster it would be if they just kind of, you know, yeah. The, the, if that mood of ex I just couldn't I just felt that they needed something and did you were people looking after you or did you yourself know 
uh, do you did you kind of like instinctively know how to how, how well, to be that it would take yes, a period of adjustment? Just instinctive, really, because we were we were at uh, an RAF base, Bryce Norton, um, uh, uh, not Bryce Norton, the other one, anyway, wherever it was, and we were there in a secluded wing which was our hospital wing, really. Um, and uh, the, the food was, was provided, but again, it wasn't, um, I mean, if we'd have wanted lots of alcohol, could have, could have taken it. I actually, as a result of that, it was partly as a result of that experience, became a complete teetotaler. Mm -hmm. I'm nothing against alcohol at all. I mean, I think in moderation, it's fine, but I just became a complete teetotaler and I've never, never had a drink for years. Um, and um, the food there was provided, which I could have whatever I wanted, but it was all, I did, somehow for me, it was just simple food that I needed mm -hmm. and that's all I had. I didn't crave anything. But I think you, I have seen people go wild and I have some people, and it's 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 not done them any good at all. No. You know, they come back too quickly. They've sort of gorged themselves too quickly, and it's made them ill. Mm -hmm. mm. So the re-entry from any, as we say, as from any traumatic experience, the re-entry mm. needs considerable thought, doesn't it? Karen Moore is asking, she says, I'd be interested to hear a bit more about your journey with Emmaus, please. Yeah. Well... With Emmaus, uh, as I say, Robert Rumsey asked me, we got together a little group of people in Cambridge and we raised substantial sum. We had one porter cabin and a caravan and Paul Bain and his wife were the first community leaders and put, they had small children. They lived in this caravan. Paul was an ex-policeman. And he said, he got fed up with uh, locking people up. He said, I'd really like to try and do some work for rehabilitation. And he gave himself, as his, with his wife, unstintingly to that job. And it, we owe a lot to Paul for getting that first community going. Um, and gradually we built up support. I mean, Emmaus in Cambridge now is so well known. Everybody knows it. Now, initially we've had, problems along the way. Many people have said, for example, I remember once in St Albans, St Albans which is quite a nice residential area, and there was a nurse's home which was derelict and we took it over and it was adjacent to rather a nice housing uh, development. Remember the people in the housing development said, we don't want drug addicts and no no goods on our doorstep we're going to cause endless trouble and so I met with them and I said look come with me let's hire a let's hire a coach let me take as many of you as I can as we can down to Brighton to see one of our communities there so we filled the coach actually and we went to Brighton and met with the community there it was next door to a school the headmistress from the school came in she said, you know, this is one of the best things that's happened to our, to our community. Mm. Um, that little group in St Albans were really convinced. The project went ahead and the chief opponent to the project in the early days became a member, of, became a trustee of, of a mayor's. <laughs> because, you see, it, it, you've got there's the popular image of the, of the homeless and the homeless shelters as being places where full of drug, drug addicts, um, full of no goods, who are gonna cause a lot of community trouble. We have the policy, no alcohol on premises, no drugs on premises. If those things are broken, there's a disciplinary procedure, but we don't turn people away. And we believe that the community is there, not just for the benefit of those who are in it, but for the benefit of the wider community too. And that's what happens. And people have found right across the country that a mass has been of real benefit to their wider community and also dealing with a great social problem, which is a certain category of people who are homeless and who could never live or work anywhere else uh, apart from that type of community. And there are very few of them. We only have 30 and we had one, you know, years ago. 
We only have 30 now. Mm -hmm. And we desperately need, Cornwall could do with it too. Many people have got that impression of Cornwall of being, you know, such a wonderful holiday resort full of rich people and so on. And it is a wonderful place. But you know Cornwall, you know the real poverty and real difficulty in Cornwall. And many people drift down into Cornwall expecting to find the golden pot and find themselves in a hopeless state. Mm. We desperately needed more, more than one community in, in Cornwall. Let's hope we can get one. And David Hurd is asking, what do you think is the greatest help that Emmaus gives? Enabling people to have a sense of their dignity and self-worth, really. That's what it does. Um, enable them to recognize that, all right, you've had a mixed past for a variety of reasons. We're not, we're not interested in that. What we're interested in, you now and your future. And we're going to make it possible, and you're going to make it possible to have a positive future. That's what happens. That does happen. It doesn't happen in every case. It's inevitably, there are people who can't do that. There are inevitably there are failures. But to enable people to have that sense of dignity and self worth, and that's a very precious gift. Once people get that, once people recognise that, I I remember on one of my birthdays, I gave a a little party in a, 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 a restaurant in London, a rather nice restaurant in in the, the market near Southwark Cathedral and overlooking the market and I invited a couple of uh, companions, some companions, some Emmaus companions there uh, to join me for that party because they wouldn't normally get opportunity to go into such a nice restaurant and as we sat there um, one of them turned to me and he looked down at the street below he said you know I never thought I should be here he said uh, for 10 years I slept under the benches and under the tables in that market down there and for 10 years he'd been on the street and often you know when I'm in a, a, a new town or a, a night like tonight where it's raining and I think to myself, I've only got a shop doorway to look forward to. My goodness, how they do it, how some of these people do it, I don't know. They've got enormous resilience, mm -hmm. but they're people. And, well, they help themselves, and they help others. And our motto really could be, you know, help yourself by helping others. And Emmaus really would wish, I know it, would wish to be a real help to Cornwall. Mm -hmm. Well, sad as I am that we've run out of time, that does feel like a wonderful place to end. It's been such a joy and a privilege. Um, thank you so much to our wonderful audience. Thank you for the brilliant questions. Sorry we didn't have time to do all of them. Um, and thank you so much for buying the tickets, making the extra donations. And of course, a huge thanks to you, Terry, for being with us. And I, it's just been so, um, yeah, my heart's been warmed, I feel. And thank you for just being so generous and giving and a beacon of what can be achieved when adversity leads to le more learning and more doing and more being in the, being in the world. So thank you very much indeed. And can you tell um, Mrs. Cordwell that I look forward one day to having more of her shepherd's pie. <laughs> <laughs> she yes. makes a good shepherd's pie. <laughs> That's very good to know, Charlotte. We might all be coming round. <laughs> <laughs> okay, bye-bye. Thank you. Should I hand back to you, Joe? Thank you. I would like to thank you both so much. That was an absolutely riveting hour i uh it was spellbinding and so insightful and inspiring and i'm sure that everybody in the audience would agree that there is so much for us all to take away um from that conversation um i i can't thank you enough for that richness of wisdom terry and kathy for those brilliant questions 
Um, so a huge thanks to both of you. And again, an enormous thank you to our wonderful audience for their support. Um, we have uh, more exciting events coming up. Uh, and if you would like to hear about those, do please sign up for our newsletter um, on our website if you haven't done that already. Um, so I'd just like to say thank you once again and please enjoy the rest of your evening. I'm sure we'll all be reflecting on what we've heard during um, uh, your conversation. Thanks everybody and we'll see you again uh, very soon. Goodbye. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye.